Soil health is a more dynamic concept. It's, it's what the soil does to function as a living ecosystem, to do things, to sustain humans, animals, and, and plants. And because it's a dynamic property, it's something that you can change. So what we're going to be talking about are these properties in terms of soil health that are properties that can be changed. I'm going to do three things. What is soil health? Now you know. Second thing is, why should you care? And the third thing is, how can you measure it? So why should you care about soil quality or soil health? Well, let me ask you, why do you change the oil in your engine and the air in your tires? Now, no one's saying anything, which means that whenever I don't change the oil in my vehicle or the air in my tires, really bad things happen, right? It's not a good thing. My car does not function well without oil in the engine and air in the tires. Think about the soil the same way. The soil doesn't function as well as it could unless you manage it appropriately. Okay? You're managing that soil environment. And in managing that soil environment, you're changing its ability to do things for you. Now there's a, a nice long list here, but the bottom one is the one that you care most about. It's the capacity of that soil to function in terms of what I call the four S. John has his four R's, I've got my four F's, that's producing food, or producing fiber, or producing forage, or producing fuel. If you're managing that soil environment so that you're getting profitable production of food and fuel and fiber and feed, you're pretty much taking care of these other functions at the same time. In fact, these are working in the background to help improve your ability to gain yields. Now, how many of you have a car that's getting more valuable with time, or a truck that's getting more valuable with time? How many realistically are getting more value if you don't have a Rolls or an MG or something like that? The problem with a vehicle is that it depreciates with time. Well, the advantage to soil health is that the soil gets more valuable with time. That's one of the reasons why you're putting in all of that effort to manage it and to improve it. Because when you do that, what you end up doing is making soils that are more resistant and more resilient. And when we say that a soil is more resistant, giving it higher quality, it means that they resist damage. They resist things like drought or chemicals, or pests, or fire, or flooding, or erosion. And they're resistant because if those things happen to them, they bounce back quicker from a bad year to maintain the same level of function or close to the same level of function that they had before. When we think about soil health then, in terms of those functions and what they can do, it combines three things, three properties, chemical properties, physical properties, and biological properties. It's a package deal. You can't improve soil health unless you're improving all three of those things. You want to think about it this way. Remember what your mom told you. Eat right. Sleep enough, get lots of exercise. Don't you wish you had listened to her? Think how much better you'd feel right now if you'd actually paid any attention. 
Those are the things. You're managing those three kinds of properties to, in the long term, improve overall soil health and soil quality. What you're trying to do with time is move from one level of soil health to a higher level of soil health by increasing those properties, optimizing those chemical, biological, and physical properties. Now they don't all change at the same rate. It's very relatively difficult to change physical properties in the soil environment. It's a lot easier to change chemical properties and it's pretty easy to actually change biological properties. They're very responsive in the short term. But that sweet spot of the best soil health or the best soil quality is right where all three of those optimized properties, chemical, physical, and biological, interact. And with time, as you make or optimize those, you're going to increase the amount of quality soil. So if there's one thing that you want to take away from this talk, it's going to be this slide. It's Coyne's laws for soil quality. Follow these laws and you're going to improve soil quality. First, and this is going to seem odd coming from a soil microbiologist because I'm telling you, don't bother about the soil biology. What you want to do is take care of the soil chemical properties and physical properties and the biological properties are going to follow. They'll improve at the same time. You can do a whole lot better managing chemical and physical properties than trying to manage the biological properties on a large scale. You can manage biological properties on a small scale, managing on a large scale a lot more difficult. The second point is there's no better way to take care of those soil chemical and physical properties than to provide organic matter above ground and below ground. Now Dr. Trove, Dr. Grove has talked about no tillage. No tillage leaves lots of nice residue on the soil surface. You're protecting your above ground. Dr. Murdoch is going to talk about cover crops and fragipans. And partly what he's going to be talking about is putting organic matter below ground in terms of those plant roots. Organic matter above ground and below ground the best way to manage chemical and structural or physical properties. Talked about what soil quality is. I talked about why you should care about it. Well, now I want to say, how do you measure it? Because if you can measure it, you can change it. And there are a whole bunch of different types of things that you can measure in terms of physical, biological and chemical properties that are linked to soil health. Physical properties like texture or bulk density or the dry aggregate size. Biological properties like beneficial or parasitic nematode numbers or particulate organic matter. The, the three that I like are potentially mineralizable N, active carbon, and the microbial respiration. Or chemical properties macronutrients, phosphorus, nitrogen, potassium, pH. And I've got a star by a bunch of these and if you went to the Missouri Soil Health Testing Facility and asked them to run all of those samples, it only cost you $149 a pop in order to get those soil quality measurements. So you don't want to measure all of those things Go to the USDA website about soil health and I'll tell you about a kit. And there's only about nine things that they think are really important for you to measure to determine soil quality in those kits. Again, biological, chemical, and physical. The biological properties, soil respiration. How much carbon dioxide is the soil releasing? How many earthworms are present? in a one foot by one foot by one foot volume of soil. Chemical properties, electrical conductivity, how saline it is, soil pH, how acid or alkaline it is, soil nitrate. 
And then physical properties, the infiltration rate, the bulk density, the aggregate stability, or soil slaking. Porosity, the first two, and the ability of soils to hold together, that second two. But I'm going to do a little bit of heresy here, and I'm going to tell you, don't bother measuring soil quality. Because there's an easier way. What's the easiest way to measure soil quality or soil health? Yield. You could do it that way. More importantly, you have somebody else measure it for you. Now, how many of you have taken a soil test recently? Uh, that's not many. That's not many. And why that's so important? Because... When we talk about the nine tests that the USDA says are good measures of showing improvement in soil quality, four of those are part of the information that you're going to get if you take a soil sam sample and you send it over to the regulatory services over at Princeton or Lexington. You're going to get pH. You're going to get macronutrients. You're going to get the total carbon and the total nitrogen content. Why measure it yourself if you can have somebody else measure it for you? I'm going to briefly go through these measures. Carbon dioxide or respiration, how would they do it? Put a cover over the ground, measure how much carbon dioxide is going to be involved. How many acres do you want to do that test for yourself? No, you don't want to do that. What's it most related to? The amount of soil organic matter or carbon that's already in the soil itself. There's a direct relationship between respiration and that number. Where can you get that number? You get that number from your soil test. What about mineralizable nitrogen? What's that related to? There's a nice relationship. Between the C-to-N ratio that exists in most soils, it's about 10 to 1, 9 to 1. And what the C-to-N ratio reflects is total carbon to total nitrogen. Where can you get total carbon? You can get it from your regulatory surfaces test. You can get that number. You can estimate how much nitrogen is going to end up being mineralized. So lots of these tests you can do, or you can get that answer from the soil test. Earthworms, after the first one foot by one foot hole that you've dug, you're not going to want to count earthworms in your fields anymore. But they're a good sign. They increase porosity. Electrical conductivity. How saline is the soil? pH acidity, alkalinity, take a soil sample, put it in water, put in a test strip or an electron probe. Who'll do that for you? Regulatory services. You don't have to do it for yourself. Soil nitrate. Well, if you've got a lot of soil nitrate, it's both good and bad. One, you had lots of mineralizable nitrogen. Two, if you've still got soil nitrate in your soil and there's no plants around to suck it up, what happens the first time that it rains? You're going to lose your soil nitrate. Now, that tells you a little bit about your nitrogen. Infiltration, hopefully it won't rain on us, but if it does rain, how much do we want it to rain relative to the amount that infiltrates? You want it to rain more you want it to infiltrate more rapidly than it will rain. And you can measure that. But again, you're talking about 30 to 40 minutes to do this particular measure. It takes a while. You have to really want to know the, some of these measures. Bulk density, mass of soil, the volume of soil, compacted soil, high bulk density, nice, friable, tillable soil, relatively low bulk density. And then things like Aggregate stability and slaking. Take a soil sample, sieve it, mix it with water, see how rapidly it breaks up. The more stable it is, the better the overall soil 
quality will be. Physical, chemical, biological properties. Take your soil samples, take in the regulatory services, get those numbers from them. And those measures tell you with time as they go up that you're improving soil quality.